uh, we're going to um, um, introduce in the next uh, uh, year. Um, this, uh, I have like 25 minutes of time, so um, we have a lot of things to, to talk about, so it's probably not su be sufficient, but I hear that uh, we can do a workshop on one of the other days and uh, with, with a little bit more time where we can sit down and talk about uh, whatever you guys want to talk about, um, if you have any further questions. But um, anyway, in this talk I just want to cover a couple of uh, really important major um, uh, points to get you up to date and what's coming on the, on the various uh, distributions. Um, um, so it's basically all the distributions have now adopted SystemD as you might know, like uh, regardless if you, if you use Debian, like the next Debian version will be SystemD, the next Ubuntu version will be SystemD. Um, uh, Fedora has been using SystemD for a while, RHEL 7 has released with SystemD, um, it's pretty much Everywhere system be there only a couple of holdouts um, um, more precise with this basic again to that doesn't have it by default but it includes it in the Slackware and it's pretty much in the big distribution that still do not use system D. Anyway, um, so let's get started. Let's uh, jump right in with KDBus. Um, you might have heard of KDBus. It's, it's a I have been talking about KDBus for for a long time already. Like like in the last two years, I already did talks about KDBus. KDBus is an IPC system um, for the Linux kernel um, that uh, we have been developing closely with SystemD in mind. Um, just to, to get you up to speed what that actually is, DBus is, uh, is an IPC system we have been using in Linux for quite some time. It's basically GNOME has been using that and KDE has been using that. Um, most of the basic building blocks of, of the operating system actually um, speak DBus. Um, as an IPC system, so with that you can actually issue commands to the lower level of the stack and say, please do this, please do that, and things like that. Um, Dbus um, has been introduced uh, 10 years ago, and Kdbus is kind of the reinvention of the, of the same semantics in, in most ways, but uh, they're doing that in the Linux kernel itself. Um, just uh, last week we posted the fourth um, kernel patch, and apparently as it looks right now, that's going to be the kernel patch that I will actually make it into the kernel. For good, but uh, yeah, and then as that happens, the, the um, user space side of um, KDBus um, sits in system D, so that system D sets up all of that. Um, to understand a little bit what the what the amazing thing about all of this is, is uh, most modern operating system designs started out with a good IPC. Like if you look at um, at uh, microkernels and things like that, they started out with a good IPC and designed everything around it on Linux um, and Unix because it's not a very modern design. Uh, we never had a uh, proper IPC. What we had was IPC primitives like uh, streams and uh, like FIFAs and things like that. And with KDBus, we finally will fill this gap and uh, introduce a really like um, IPC system that the kernel understands with all bells and whistles, with, with method calls and things like that to learn uh, as well. Anyway, um, so yeah, it's a powerful kernel level local IPC. Well, let's already jump to the next topic, which is containers. Um, you might uh, like containers have been um, pretty well known now in the like in the last years or so because of uh, Docker. Docker, everybody knows Docker. Um, like uh, I know managers at Red Hat who's every second word is Docker these days. Um, with System D, uh, we saw um, we have the duty to actually make sure that containers are integrated well to the lower levels of the operating system. This isn't really news in, in many ways because um, old operating systems like, uh, for example, Solaris had really good container um, support already 10 years ago um, with uh, um, what they call nodes. Um, and uh, with, with what we're working on in SystemD, we kind of want to close that gap that uh, has been popularized by Docker but is actually much, much older with the zones and um, support some of the stuff in SystemD itself. More specifically, those are um, three components. There's one co component called SystemD Endspawn. SystemD Endspawn is a mini container manager. It's like, in a way, you can, like if you know Docker, Endspawn does kind of the same thing. We originally wrote this mostly for our testing purposes, simply because we wrote an init system, right? And if you write an init system, so that's basically the system that brings up your computer and makes sure that it stays running. But um, if you hack on that, it's really annoying that every time you make a mistake, your entire machine um, stops working. So we wrote this container manager so that we could uh, develop our operating system inside the container. And if we made a programming mistake, we wouldn't have to reboot the, the actual physical machine. It would completely suffice if we just rebooted the, the um, container that we developed. So 
know that's how System E S one was born. Um, but it actually became really, really useful in the, in the last years because we kept, um, like, for testing purposes and for making sure that System E works very nicely inside of a container. It can also host containers nicely. Um, it actually became a pretty, pretty full-grown container system um, that, in many ways, um, can do the same things that LXC can do, the same things that Docker can do in a way, but all um, much, much simpler and, and uh, right in the, in the lower levels of the operating system. Um, there are two other components um, related to the system, the machine D and system D and Most people probably never have a kind of contact to, to that. Um, but they basically um, expose the concept of a container to the rest of the operating system. This specifically means that basically all the various tools that we, that we have in the operating system, in our opinion, should be aware of uh, what a container actually is. This starts, for example, with simple things like PS. You know the PS, the Unix PS command that shows you processes. Um, we said we want that uh, there will be a, that there is a column um, in PS that shows you um, which process belongs to which um, uh, uh, container, and that actually is implemented in a couple of uh, like years already, I think, um, by now. Um, but it, it goes through through all the rest of the stack as well. Like uh, we wanted to make sure that the container concept is, is a viable, for example, the IPC system, right? I talked about KDBus earlier. So that, that uh, you cannot just connect to services um, on the local host, but also any on the local containers. Or any of system B's commands are actually web containers as well now. Like if you, if you use system control, um, which is like if you have um, a Dell with system B is the primary interface to system B, um, it has these switches, a dash, uppercase M, that allow you to connect to any local container, right? Um, there's also a command that you can not only show the services of your local um, host, but also all the local containers running below it. So, um, many of these concepts aren't really new again. Um, Solaris had this a long time ago, was it so, so uh, basically every tool in, in Solaris was from the ground up um, uh, aware of the concept of zones, and we kind of want to um, close that gap and provide the same thing just me as well. So, um, Something we very recently added is the system the import tool. System the import is basically why, how we can uh, download um, and import and export containers. Um, this uh, big difference towards uh, um, things like Docker, I mean, this is not really an attempt to re-implement anything that Docker is doing. This is, a, this is more about uh, um, containerizing um, full operating systems. And the, and the big focus on, on that is actually that we, we think um, that it's not a good idea to introduce a new container format. We just want to make normal uh, images that are already existing compatible with containers. More specifically, um, many of the distributions provide um, uh, cloud images, which, which are basically images that you can run in KVM or, or another virtual library. And we saw, well, let's just open those up for containers and make them bootable uh, with containers. That's kind of the, the philosophy that we have been following here. Um, and spawn and import D and these kind of things, uh, they kind of focus on, on not producing any new format or any new content really. They uh, just focus on, on um, being able to, to make use of all the images that are already out there and running and run them in a container concept, context instead of a strictly virtual machine context. Um, yeah, the, the takeaway here is really we want that container as a part of the OS concept itself. They're not this thing that you run on top of it, they're inherently built into the operating system itself. Um, to the next topic, um, which is a post service firewall that we'll probably add, uh, or that we will um, add very soon. Um, it's like, uh, um, you know, if you, if you administrate an IT, you're pretty sure you, in your IP tables and, and these things, um, like how to configure a firewall. Um, we uh, um, looked into the problem of firewalling and, and figured out like what's really missing for a local firewalling is really that, that there's some kind of hookup between services in the in the firewall because um, in many many cases what people actually write down in the firewall are things like yeah port 80 may be accessed from the internet but uh, we believe that in many cases I mean in, in the case of uh, port 80 which is HTTP it's really easy but in the, in the with our part it's more difficult if the if the port number is, is, is not fixed. Um, that uh, um, what we believe is actually that you probably want to express Apache shall be accessible from the internet rather than port 80 shall be accessible from the internet. So that it doesn't really matter which port is used anymore, but you actually can express inside of the firewall, well, it's, uh, it's Apache or it's uh, MySQL or it's whatever else is actually accessible. 
So um, something that we'll add very soon to system V there is a, is a, is a post service firewall, which basically, I mean, on one hand, we don't really want to be able to, like, like system V is not supposed to be this the place where, where you actually configure the full set of the firewall. But everything that we want to provide is a, is a most basic um, uh, uh, connection between service management and firewall. So more specifically, this will boil down to one option, where you can basically say firewall equals um, uh, accept, reject, deny, which do what you might think that, that it does. And also custom, and in the case of custom, what the effect will be is that, that uh, all traffic generated by a service will actually be directed to a, to a, a separate chain in, in IP tables, if you know IP tables so far. Anyway, the, the, the takeaway of this is that we're kind of closing a gap there with, with local um, firewalling and, and services. Um, oh, this also has uh, one nice side effect, is that we will actually be able to do traffic accounting per service. Um, so if you do type system control status to see the status of a specific service, um, by using the, the firewall accounting um, functionality, we will then s show you basically um, the individual traffic that specific services have generated, like incoming and outgoing traffic. It's actually kind of cool. Um, then another thing that we have been working on and that uh, we'll, we'll continue working on in this year is uh, system network D. Um, we believe, like, like the way we define system D nowadays is basically the system you should contain all the most basic building blocks that uh, the vast majority of systems um, require. Um, we believe that network configuration is one of them. Um, so uh, uh, a couple, of, like a year ago or so, we added this component system in network D, which is um, basically a network management solution that um, we think is a lot smarter than the, the, the previous ones. Like we sit down and try to figure out what we actually want from a network management solution. Um, and that's what we came up with. Um, nowadays, it has a lot of functionality that is not like that all the other network management solutions do not have, and specifically, it does a couple of things that network manager can't do. On the other hand, it's, there's also a lot of things that network manager can, uh, can do that we can't. But uh, yeah, anyway, if you if you if you do into network management, this is really something you, you might want to look into. Um, like for example, it runs in in the container environments, it runs in in early boot environments and things like that, that um, which is all something that network manager cannot really deal with. Um, we have been, uh, like our philosophy with system in network is really that uh, we don't want it to be this thing where, where things are glued together with shell scripts and things. We want everything nicely integrated with proper APIs and, and C and, and, and bus APIs. So um, this had the effect, like for example, because we figured out that um, Basic things like DHCP, for example, um, we didn't want to glue the existing implementations together that, that don't really integrate that nicely. And given that DHCP is actually a relatively simple protocol, we, we hence came up with our own little library doing this. Um, which is actually really interesting because the network manager decided that our little library is actually better than what they were doing as well, and are using our library as well. Um, anyway, this is kind of the philosophy. Um, there are a couple of things coming up in that area as well, like for example, we will have a native PPP we implementation and, and a couple of things. Um, we have, uh, this is also hooked up to the firewall and specifically uh, mask creating and things. So um, uh, previously, um, IP configuration, like, like, like IP firewalling and IP routing, which completely separately configured from, from the actual um, uh, physical interfaces. And with network, we kind of want to resolve that and to make sure that you can actually configure everything. So, um, yeah, it, it's growing, it's, it's already like, what, what we have in mind there is that, that um, it's good enough that you can actually build a router from that, and actually some people are doing that, um, like Intel, um, are working on, on, on an embedded router, like a, like a switch, um, that you use system network for the configuration, and um, so it, it can those all these modes, like uplink, downlink you know, schemes now, that you can actually say that, yeah, you need those, um, uh, downlink is connected before the uplink you know, is powered on and things like that. So, um, and this all kind of embedded stuff is something that's a network manager can do. So, anyway, enough about the network D. Um, something else we have been working on is system resolve D. It's another little demo. Um, it's uh, responsible for, for name resolution. Name resolution being um, things like DNS, like host name resolution. Um, uh, and uh, like the, the 
the rationale why we uh, wanted to, to, to do this is basically that uh, previously in Linux, um, basically every single application would do its own DNS requests inside of its own process, which is a certain level of um, like uh, security sensitive simply because every single process that you run um, implements a little bit of a DNS stack and nothing is really cached. So um, our intention with Resolve D really is uh, is to have a local, um, a small local demo that can uh, that can do uh, DNS resolution and can cache things, and uh, also um, does fundamentally a couple of things that previously were impossible. Um, more and more specifically, um, more specifically, uh, it has support for actually multi hosts hosts in, in a small way, like uh, the traditional problem being there, like on my laptop I'm connected to the Red Hat VPN, but I'm also connected to my local LAN. Um, traditionally, this means that I either could resolve the, the, the uh, um, host names that were defined by the by VPN, like the Red Hat um, host names, the um, Red Hat host names, or I could um, resolve the host names in my local LAN, um, which are my private um, host names, but not both, because you could only configure one DNS server so that would be queried. Um, with Resolve D, um, we kind of resolve, uh, solve these issues by um, allowing that the requests can always be sent to um, the DNS servers of all interfaces in parallel in the first uh, um, positive and the last negative parts that's used, basically merging the DNS servers that way, um, so that, that things start to work that have not working work for. Other things the system to resolve D does is actually LLMNR, which is a Microsoft protocol for, for lead local name resolution. So basically that you that you if you, if you connect multiple networks in the line that they can just talk to each other and know each other by name without any further configuration. It's implemented by all the Windows um, systems and we have implemented the system to resolve the, the background of this is actually containers again because what we wanted to do is that if you run uh, multiple containers in your local host um, and they're connected via some virtual network that they can actually find each other by their names um, without having to configure anything. Um, so yeah, another thing that we're going to implement as well is uh, DNSX support because we believe today's internet, um, the, the DNSX stuff should not be optional, should just work and be there by default. And um, also MDNS, um, the NSSD, which is like the Apple kind of part of the LNR stuff that I talked about earlier. Um, so the last thing that I have about is the second boot stuff. Um, something that we believe that is our ability to provide is, is that we can uh, um, have, a, have an operating system where um, you have a trusted pass um, where, where every software, all the software that runs in your system is, is verified and uh, nobody can, can modify the system without you knowing it. Um, this is, is particu particularly relevant in a, in a plus snowden world where, where, where data centers can't be trusted anymore because, because the NSA or, or whoever gets access, like physical access to machines can, can manipulate the operating system operating systems would just work as before and nothing would notice that they have been manipulated. So um, uh, we're just introducing as our duty that operating systems can actually be, be locked down so that the, that the hardware refuses to, to boot properly signed um, uh, operating system and you have a complete chain of trust from the earliest hardware all the way to the rest of the operating system. Um, this uh, making use of UFI second boot. UFI second boot has a bit of a bad reputation in the Source community because so far it was always marketed as something on Microsoft wanted to be nasty to, to Linux. We think it's actually a great opportunity for Linux because, um, uh, well, it is all, not only a way how you can uh, um, bind yourself to Microsoft, it's also a way how you can kick out Microsoft from the NSA and well, well, also from your computer because you basically can say, I want my computer to only boot um, uh, software that has been signed by the Fedora project, or you can even take it further and say, I want my computer to only boot stuff that um, I have signed myself and nothing else. Anyway, in, uh, in something that we have merged um, very recently in the system is GUMI boot. Um, GUMI boot is a bootloader, a UFI bootloader. Um, the reason we did this is basically to get this, this um, a chain of trust into place um, so that we have a, have a scheme basically that we can say, yeah, the firmware only boots um, the, the, our GUMI boot bootloader, the GUMI boot only uh, boots um, uh, kernels that have been uh, properly signed, and uh, these kernels contain an RD that is also signed, and so on and so on, and that will only boot from signed disks so that you get a check. Anyway, it's really awesome stuff. It's so awesome stuff not only for clients, but it's also something that one of the reasons we're doing this is for, for the Trusted Data Center. Um, 
we would like to have a system, a, a scheme where um, data center and centers can be mentioned later. Anyway, this is kind of everything that I have in my time is over. Um, can we have questions or something? So uh, let's have a few questions. And uh, other than that, again, I think we can do a, a, a workshop um, one of the other days, but I still have to register that or something. So I can't really tell you when that's going to be. And, uh,